everybody. I'm Tom Vassell. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast. This is a show all about board games and the people who play them. This episode is sponsored by Pandasar's Games, who has Dinosaur World and Rar, the the Rar and Right game. They're on Kickstarter. It's the final week. Lots of stuff's been unlocked for both of those. Check it out. There's a link in the description below for those. Uh, Pandasaurus also makes God's Loves Dinosaurs, which you saw us play last week live here on the channel. And we have a contest right now that you can win uh, uh, one of three copies for this game. This is for those who live in North America. All you have to do to enter this contest is to email us at contest at dicetower.com. In the subject line, put the word dinosaur and then put your address in the description and three lucky winners. You have all week to enter this contest. So that's going on. Also, later this week, uh, Shucks, the Shut Up and Sit Down online convention is happening. And this coming Friday, I'm going to be on it. If you go to their Twitch stream, we'll put a link to that in the description below. This coming Friday, 5 o'clock Eastern Time, me and Quinns are going to talk about five games that the other person doesn't like or likes, but basically five games the other person's wrong about. Some fun going back and forth. Uh, me and Quinns haven't uh, done a lot of videos together at all, so this will be a fun thing for us to do. And I hope you join us over on their channel to see that. And it's only a week and a half away before we do our live Essence Spiel coverage that's coming up next week. So I hope you enjoy that. Look forward to that. Let's get started. This list was inspired to me uh, from comments from one of the threads where people were talking about gifts to give people on anniversaries. They were talking about anniversaries, and of course, there's this list of gifts, like on your first anniversary, you're supposed to give someone paper products. I've never followed this, never understood it, but what if this was board games? Here, here's 10 corresponding items for your gaming anniversary. If you have a very close person who's a relationship, and you're both gamers, here's what you should get. First anniversary, the paper anniversary, get them a roll and write game. That's ah, short, simple, easy, cheap, and it's just one year. So let's see what happens. Year three is leather. So for there, I'd get them a dice bowl. A lot of dice bowls are made out of leather, maybe even a dice tower. Dice towers aren't necessarily made out of leather, but you can get a nice dice tower or dice bowl. Uh, not only is it a useful thing to use at a table in gaming if you're chucking dice, but they also look really good. Year five is wood. Well, here I would do a traveling trip to Ikea and get them a Calyx bookshelf. Calyx bookshelves, of course, are the ultimate bookshelves for board gaming, outside of ones, obviously, that you can customize yourself. I really like them. Tenth anniversary is tin and aluminum. I don't know what to put for that one. So, hey, get them a Kickstarter pledge. Or maybe just say, hey, find me a Kickstarter, I'll get you the all-in pledge for it. For 10 years, that's a pretty nice thing. 15 year anniversary, Crystal. Well, I don't have anything for that. Uh, get a legacy game and play it with that person. Pick one of the legacy games, or maybe a campaign game, and say, we're gonna play this through to completion. It's the playing with it to completion part that's the gift, more so than getting them the game itself. Uh, 20 year anniversary, China. Ooh. Um, speaking of going to China, I know it's not what the, they're talking about, dinnerware China, but a trip to a convention. Hey, I got you a trip to Gen Con, or, you know, but hopefully by that time we can go to conventions again, but get a hotel and stuff. That's a pretty pricey thing, but it's 20 years. 25 years, silver. Well, here's where you, like, look for their favorite game and buy some upgrades for it. Maybe go to Etsy and look for some stuff, or, you know, buy some custom meeples for it, or metal coins. You know, this is not a big, huge, expensive gift, but it's one that lets them know that you're being very thoughtful for them. 30 years, pearls. Well, I'm not finding anything here. Get one of their games and find someone and get all those miniatures painted. Because pearl's a color and that's a paint color. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Paint, get their miniatures painted by a professional and make them look good so they'll keep that game forever. 40 year anniversary. Wow, you've known this person for a long time at this point in time. This is where you buy them a game table. Go to Rath Sky, it's been like 40 years. This is a game table. We'll be able to use this for gaming, for eating. We got, we're probably retired at this point. Let's play games. And 50 years, wow. You know, when you meet someone who's been married for 50 years, that's a phenomenally awesome achievement, in my opinion, and good for them. And uh, so for that, 
You don't need to give that person anything. They know at this point, whether you're just a good friend or you're in a relationship, that they love that you love them. And there you just sit down and relax and play a game because at this point, gifts don't matter. Not that they ever did anyway. Those are my choices for 10 anniversary gifts. You got some other fun ideas? This is all silliness. Mention them in the comments below. Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Maple University. Today we talk about Steampunk Rally. This is the basic game. Yes. And there There's has been Kickstarter after this, which is the Fusion. Fusion expansion, yes. Mm -hmm. We've played this one a few times. I remember, like, it plays up to eight. And I remember my first experience playing it was at a meetup with eight people. Yes. I think you were among them. I was, I yeah. You yeah. played that one with me. Um, and it was confusing. It was hard to work out what was going on with so many players. Mm -hmm. um, but I understand it now. And I think I... It's just slightly different mechanics because it's kind of like towards the beginning of our board game journey or board game journey. Yeah, I think what I misconstrued about this game was that it was a race. It's not a race, it's like a, it's a card drafting game and it's a dice drafting game and the racetrack is actually just a um, scoring points. slightly more complicated scoreboard. But it is also a race though, if you look at it, like you have to combine your engine, build your engine together with mm. rockets and all those things and to race ahead and then win the race. I say race like five times. I will say I've had a bit of fun with the storytelling side of this game. Oh, yeah. Strapping <sighs> rockets onto the back of a penny farthing and um, <laughs> trying desperately to win and just and just exploding. <laughs> that was really fun. So uh, that is Steampunk Rally and we are Meeple University on YouTube and on the Dice Tower for how to play Pocket Playthrough and Live Playthrough. See you next time! Hi everybody. Hello, we are Ryan and Bethany. From Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. And today we're talking about Furtherance. This is from Flannel Games. So in this game, what's happening is you are building all these buildings. You are kind of an engine building thing going on, but also what you're doing is there's a board and you buy these cards, which are your units. They're gonna move around the board and attack each other, eventually try to attack each other's castles. Uh, you can win the game either by getting victory points or by killing everybody's castles. Uh, so yeah, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was had some cool, quirky things to it. I like the artwork. I was a big fan. Yeah, so I'm undefeated in this game, and I'm also don't love it. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like um, it, I tried exploring it, and I tried doing other things, but there was only one path to victory, and I was able to get there, and it just, like, I don't know. I don't know, guys. This just wasn't enjoyable for me. I'm sorry. All right, so just like how I enjoyed this game, and Bethany didn't, right now we are trying out a new diet where... She likes all the ingredients that we get to use, and I don't. Uh, but the reality is, I need to get outside of my comfort zone. And just like Bethany has to play this game with me occasionally, I have to eat weird meats and vegetables and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's like basically all it is, is meat and vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> so I know it's good for me, even though I don't like it. Um, but yeah, it's, that's the moral of the story. Get outside of your comfort zone, try something uh, new, uh, and yeah. <laughs> if you... Want to find out more from us? You can find us on YouTube or Facebook. We are Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. So everybody, this is Ryan. I'm Bethany. Hoping you have a happy bacon filled breakfast. <sighs> Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs>
it's it's got this similar sort of thing you know you build your deck and you go and fight monsters and when thunderstone quest came out a few years ago that seemed like the perfect mix to me of uh, deck builder and dungeon crawl you've got a marketplace you can upgrade your heroes you can buy swords and weapons and things like that or you can go out and fight monsters and you'll gain treasure and points and possibly wounds as well I really like the idea of it. Like I say, I, I like that aspect of you've got your deck building, your hand management, but also going out and doing a dungeon crawl, going out and sort of fighting monsters and being a hero. Looks really good fun. Now, I realized I talked about Clank and Clank Acquisitions Incorporated recently, and reading reviews, I think that you could have both of them in your collection quite happily. They've got a slightly different feel. But Bearing in mind that I can't even afford one of them, if you had to choose, which one would you choose? I'm curious what you have to say in the comments below, and until next time, bye! So I'm reviewing several games this week. Beyond the Sun from Rio Grande, this werewolf cooperative game here. All four of us are going to be taking a look together at Unicorn Fever, Tidal Blades, Heroes of the Reef I'll be reviewing, and there's a good chance I'll be reviewing some of these games in the top row. Haven't quite determined all the games I'm reviewing yet. The biggest review that I'm doing will be going up tomorrow, and that's Etherfields, a huge game from Awakened Realms. I've been playing this one for well over a dozen hours at this point in time so that I can give a good accounting of it. That's a huge game, so there's that. We'll be doing a top 10 list later this week. Me, Mike, and Z, this is the top 10 games where the first turn is incredibly important or vital to the game. So uh, come back and join us on Thursday. And of course, we got live shows. If you miss our crowd surfing show every Wednesday, we talk about upcoming Kickstarter games. On Thursdays, we do Board Game Breakfast where we talk about the news and skewer Mr. Bonacore with different uh, witty or non-witty retorts back and forth. That's a lot of fun. I do a live Q&A each Monday. It's only a few hours from now at noon Eastern time, so come by for that. And we got multiple live plays going up this week. This is a busy packed week. Lots of content. I hope you enjoy it. And if that gets boring, we got all our stuff on the podcast. Me and Eric have a podcast going out uh, tomorrow where we talk about our best games that start with the letter T. Not including the word the and more. You can find all that at dicetowernetwork.com. Hey, we are back with another Name the Game segment. On this one, it was a little bit of a trick question since it's from a game that was on Kickstarter. I can't make them all easy for you guys, but if you guess that this was from Deck of Wonders, you get an all star breakfast. Deck of Wonders is this unique solo co-op card game with some of the most amazing artwork. I can't even pick a favorite card. Okay, well, it's probably Pixie Calvary, because let's be honest, Pixie's riding corgis, but I digress. It's going to remind you of Hearthstone or even Magic the Gathering, but trust me, it comes with its own surprises. Designer and publisher Dennis Furia has brought a whole new world to life. You see, you've stolen the Deck of Wonders from Fate herself. She's not very happy about it. And there's no way you're going to just get to walk away with it. So her minions are going to do everything, and I mean everything, in their power to stop you. So if you like deck building or crafting your own deck, I think you're really going to enjoy the cool spin on this one. So first you combine your deck with the villain's deck you're facing off against, and all of the cards are double-sided, hero side and villain side. You take turns drawing cards from the community deck. Now these villains are no joke, and it's going to test your skills to defeat them. Your team of allies will attack based on their priority, but you will be able to adjust the order your villains attack you. And you gotta think through each attack, try to keep as many of your allies on the playing field as possible. And it is this awesome back and forth that makes this game so good. Oh, and one of the coolest features in the game are legacy packs. So each villain has a list of conditions you complete in order to unlock these packs. We've got a full playthrough as well as five reasons why you should check this game out over on our YouTube channel. So head over there to learn a little bit more about this one. And all right, before we sign off, here is your clue for next time. Do you know what game this is from? Have a happy breakfast. Hey guys, it's Deanna. Today I'm going to be sharing with you another educational game that you can play with your kids. And today's game is My First Bananagrams. My First Bananagrams is a great basic word building game for kids. To start the game, all tiles are turned face down and each player draws 15 tiles. 
All players will begin using their tiles to create a grid of words. You may swap one letter tile at a time from the draw pile if you need to. The player who uses all of their tiles first is the winner. In another variation of this game, each player uses two of the combo letter tiles in addition to their 15 single letter tiles. Sometimes we like to play this game cooperatively. We each take letter tiles and try to create one giant grid as a group. I help the kids with spelling larger words, and we can trade letter tiles back and forth with each other. Once we have used up all the letter tiles, then I usually make up some kind of silly story using all the words we created. I really like how versatile the letter tiles are. They're really great to have on hand when you're teaching your kids to spell and read. I like that the included instruction booklet gives parents ideas for other ways to use the letter tiles. For example, you can have young kids practice putting tiles in alphabetical order. You can also play a letter matching game. The combo letter tiles are a great way to practice creating rhyming words, word families, and words with digraphs. My First Bananagrams is a really fun way to practice spelling with younger kids and older kids. I really like that this version has a lot of the digraphs already together, a lot of the vowel teams and word family tiles already have two letters, so that makes it a lot more approachable for um, kids who are just starting out learning to spell. So that's gonna be it for today. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of Board Game Breakfast, and I'll be back next time to share another educational game. What is up? My name is Melissa McCack and this is Smashing Buttons and Slamming Cards. This is a segment where I talk about a video game I love and I connect it to a board game I love. And this week I want to talk about The Witcher 3. So The Witcher is an RPG style open world game where you're going around, you're going through the main story quest line, there's tons of side quests to go on, there's uh, even like the CCG that you could play in the game called Quent or something? I forgot. Anyway, so it is an awesome game, but you're playing as what is called the Witcher, and you're like this brooding person, and everybody is sort of like afraid of you, and you're kind of mysterious and dark and super powerful. So I want to connect that to... Oh, Mage Knight Ultimate Edition. This box is bigger than I am. Anyway, so Mage Knight is this amazingly awesome game. It has this sort of, I guess, open world feel to it. RPG for sure. I feel like I'm playing a video game when I play this game. I, I really only play it solo. I really like it that way. But the main thing that uh, gets me about this game is you are playing as this character that's a Mage Knight and you're again like this brooding person. You're mysterious, super powerful. People aren't quite sure what to make of you. Just like in The Witcher where you're playing, you know, as this person that like you know, people are kind of like, I don't know if I should trust you or not, kind of thing. Which is really interesting, really cool. Uh, both games, you're you're going off on like quests and stuff. There's uh, this main, I guess like, quest that you have to go on in Ultimate and in, uh, Mage Knight, but there's a bunch of different side things you could do to like, upgrade your equipment and your army and all that sort of stuff. It's really cool. Anyway, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like, you can check out mine and my brother's channel called Room 51. I'll catch you next time. You will never believe I have an idea for a new pirate game that's also dinosaurs. And you might sit there and say, come on, Tom, pirates and dinosaurs, there are too many of those games coming out right now. And you're right, there is a lot of pirate games, there's a lot of dinosaurs, but hang on, it's also a roll right. That's right, there's a lot of roll and rights at this point too. So there's these trends that go through board gaming. You know, there's always going to be some things that are happening uh, when a new mechanism is very popular. Like when deck building came out with Dominion, everybody was making deck building games. If a theme is suddenly becomes popular, you have a bunch of games about Mars or about zombies or about, right now, pirates and dinosaurs seem to be very popular. Uh, if, if some gimmick is out there, that might become popular. And we tend to, you know, react to this. Not another whatever the game is. Not another roll and write game. Not another zombie game. And so, I, I, on one hand, I get that, right? We we would like there to be more games that, you know, go to unique topics that have unique mechanisms and that are something different. 
Unless, of course, it's uh, something we like, right? So I haven't complained at all about all the pirate games out there because, or dinosaur games for that matter, because I really like pirates and dinosaurs. And so the more pirates and dinosaurs games, the better. I do think there's too many zombie games and there's too many uh, trading and Mediterranean games, but that's because both of those themes don't appeal to me at all. And there's some truth to that, right? You know, uh, people say you can't have too much of a good thing, which is not quite true. But if you like it, you're willing to try and do more things of that genre. There was all, the whole group of people who love train games. I think the train game thing has been themed out at this point. But if you love train games, another train game, hooray! And so we have to realize this. That's one thing. Two, uh, just because there might be too many of, insert A, too many social deduction games, too many of this, that's not all of gaming. There are so many games out that, I mean, as I'm recording this, there's probably five to six games that came out today, or at least if we average it out over the course of the year. Year is 300 uh, days, 65 days in it, and there may be 3,000 games that come out over the course of the year, which is an average around 10 games a day. That's crazy. You're not going to get to play all of them. That's tons of them. What are you going to do? Well, the fact is, is that for every game that you say, oh, not another zombie game, they made a game of something that you do like. You can't play all the games anyway. Believe me, I've tried. It's not possible. So trends are certainly there. And uh, hypocritically, I'm probably still going to complain about them occasionally. Like, oh, there's too many of this and that. And I think it's legitimate to look at a game and say, this is the 20th game about Russian cathedrals. It's not. But let's say it was. And say, and to that end, I have to hold up against all the other Russian cathedral games. So I think that's a legitimate thing to do. I just don't know that it's worth getting that worked up about, that there's too many of X games, because these trends come and go, but the good games, they last forever. Howdy, everybody. For today's project, I wanted to design a simple cardboard dice or component tray that you can customize with whatever pattern you want. It's light and small, so it can fit in most game boxes. And you can also stack it up and store it on a shelf that way. So let's try making one. To start, go to the link shown below and print out the template on plain paper. Then using spray glue or a glue stick, glue the template onto the printed side of some cereal box cardboard or something of similar weight. Next we're going to choose the covering you want. You can use colored paper, fabric, wrapping paper, or find a patterned image online. Now you want a pattern large enough to cover a whole piece of paper. Then you're going to glue your covering paper to the back side of the cardboard. Once the glue has dried, score all the dashed lines on the template using a ruler and something like a butter knife or a knitting needle. Then cut out the two pieces along all the solid lines using a sharp knife or scissors. Pre-bend all the triangular tabs. Working your way from one end, Bend the long piece into a peaked hexagonal ring. Apply some hot glue to the end tab and then hold it in place until it's set. If you want felt or velvet on the inside of your tray, you can add this layer now and cut to size. Align the center triangle tabs so they all sit flat against the table. Then apply glue to the tops of all the triangles at once and press the hexagon base on top. And there you go. Now, a simple one today, but hopefully a fun way to make some personalized trays. Now, go out there and give it a try yourself. I'm David, and I'll see you next time on Upgrade DIY. And today I'm going to tell you about Utopia Engine, which is a solo roll and write game of adventure and exploration. In Utopia Engine, you're trying to prevent doomsday from happening by building this Utopia Engine. You do this by searching for artifacts, finding them, activating them, and linking them together all before time runs out. 
Throughout the game, there's a lot of pressure because there's multiple ways you can lose. First, there's a time pressure because you're trying to get all this done before the time track runs out and Doomsday happens. Also, there's the health track because while you're searching for things, you can also run into different monsters and those can attack you and you lose health. So if you die or if time runs out, then you lose the game. Most of the mechanics in the game involve rolling two dice and then putting the value of one die in a top box and the value of another one in the bottom box. Depending on what action you're doing, you want to get either a high or low difference between two numbers in the top and bottom boxes. For example, when you're searching, there's two three digit numbers that you'll have after three turns of rolling two dice and you want the lowest possible number in order to find an artifact. But searching is fun because if you fail to find an artifact, you can also run into monsters and they can drop loot after they fight you. If you fail super horribly and get a really high number as the difference, then you can run into a really high level monster which can drop a legendary treasure. These legendary treasures give you bonuses that help you in future rolls. So sometimes you want to try to fail horribly when you're searching in order to try to get that legendary treasure. Overall, Utopia Engine is an epic roll and write game with a good feeling of adventure. There can be a lot of luck in the dice rolls that make you either do really well or really poorly, but the individual successes and failures are really fun and exciting, so it's fun whether you win or lose. And with trying to get all the legendary treasures, there's so much more to the game than just activating the Utopia Engine and winning. Bye! Hello, and welcome back to Retro Board Game Corner. Here I have the Smurf Game, published in 1981 by Milton Bradley. This is a two to four player game in which you're trying to collect baskets of fruit and take them back home. Let me set this up and show you how it works. This is what the game board will look like set up. Everybody's going to pick a Smurf and it's going to start over here at the home base. On every turn you can do one of two things. You can roll a six-sided dice to move that many spaces along the blue path, or you can move either one of these discs one notch over, like so. As you're moving your Smurf along the path, every time you cross one of these discs, you'll just go ahead and pick it up and put it in front of you. There's four different foods that you can get in the game. Your path is blocked if you see Azrael the cat in one of these areas over here. Also, if you're in this area and the cat appears on there, you will lose one of your food baskets and you have to go all the way back to your home base. The object of the game is to get one of each of the four food baskets and take them back home. First person that does that will win the game. The Smurfs animated series in the United States ran from 1981 to 1989, with several specials and movies throughout the years. But the Smurfs first appeared in Belgian comics back in 1958. Well, that's all the time I have for now. If you have a comment, comment below, or you can tweet at me at RetroBoardGamer. And as always, may your rolls be high. And that's it for another Board Game Breakfast. Thanks, everybody, as always, for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to enter our contest to win a copy of God's Love Dinosaurs. Like I said, we got a lot of stuff coming this week, so we need to get going and cracking to do it. I'll see you then. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production.